We're going to begin our service by lighting Christ's candle. We'll light this candle to remind us that the light of Christ is always with us, in our hearts, dispelling the darkness wherever it may be. The light of Christ. In keeping with recent United Church practices and the fulfilling of calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Report, we in the United Church of Canada recognize the Aboriginal peoples of this land, the Inuit and the Métis, as the original stewards of this land. We are all people of these treaties, signed in good faith. Let us live up to the spirit of these treaties in all our undertakings, respecting the land and learning from these people. Here today is love, freely available to all. Not our human loving, fragile and intermittent, but God's supreme love. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous songs of praise. Here today is love, higher than the loftiest hopes, deeper than the immensity of time and space, God's inclusive love. Let the seas roar with praise and everything in them. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills sing together in their happiness. The joy of the living Christ be with you all. Our Lord Jesus said, 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You are truly my friends if you do as I command. Let us make our confession. Most holy God, most, most of the time we see ourselves as nice people who are trying to do the loving thing in a difficult world. We try not to lie, cheat, malign, abuse, or injure others. We try to serve you through the church and within our community. We pray for peace and justice and we attempt to forgive those who sin against us. By the standards of love in the wider community, we've not done so badly. Yet deep within, we know how far we fall short of the love standard set by Jesus. And we even fall beneath that love of our own individuals, our own ideals have set for us. We feel compromised and misled by this hustling world with its glitter. We become frustrated and undermined by a negativity within ourselves, which diverts us and leads us into withholding love. Loving God, we certainly need your pardoning grace, and humbly we ask for it, but also we need much more. We seek the grace of self-honesty and a sharper awareness of our own hearts. We need your illuminating light, helping us to see through the humbug of society. We need to allow ourselves to become saturated with your love. We ask for the spur in your spirit to make us more eager for the art of, loving, of true love and more determined to practice what we preach. Grant us these graces, we pray, for without you we are as nothing. Hear our prayer through Christ our Savior. My sisters and brothers, in the family of God, listen well, for it is written of old, you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and astounding in steadfast love. What was thus written was in fulfillment of time made gloriously visible in this accessibility of Jesus of Nazareth. In God, God, in God's name, please welcome into your minds this living truth and accept it into your hearts, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let it be, Lord, let it be. Amen. Let us pray. Most holy friend, three-person God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, please help the family of the church to learn the way of love from you. Bring us together in spirit and action, bearing one another's burdens and sharing one another's gifts, and establishing here on earth colonies of heaven. In the name of Christ, our brother and our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from the first letter of John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Christ is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water alone, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is true. The words of the Lord. And our gospel reading today comes from the gospel according to John. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept you. I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. 
I have told you this, that by my joy, <coughs> that by my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do as I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you, so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the Gospel of Christ. Hear what these ancient words are saying to us today. Creator and maker of all of us, speak in the calming of our mind and the longing of our heart, by the words of my lips and the thoughts that they form. Speak, O oh Lord, for your servants are listening. <coughs> There's a story about a young woman searching for that Mother's Day card. And she was having a devil of a time finding the right card for her mom, because her and her mom really did not have a close relationship. So she shared her dilemma with her friend at work. Her friend told her that it's only natural to have mixed family and feelings about somebody that is close to you. We have such high expectations about our mothers that we're bound to be let down at some point. Well, the young woman nodded her head and she snorted at that comment. Because after all, her mother let her down all the time as far as she was concerned. When her colleague saw that she needed some wiser counsels, 
She said, well, whenever I'm having a problem, I ask God for help. So that's what the young woman did. She went off and she prayed to God that God would show her the right card that she needed for that occasion. Well, here it was, less than a week before Mother's Day, only a handful of cards still on the rack. And she goes in there and she picks up this card with great anticipation because she felt she was led to that one. Did God lead her to the right card? It had beautiful gold print on it. She picked it up and she read the print on the front. And it said, to my daughter on Mother's Day. Well, that's not right, she thought. I want this for my mother, not my daughter. <laughs> but then she pictured her mother standing in a car rack, in front of a car rack, something similar to the one she was standing in front of. And she remembered all those birthday cards that her mother had given her over the years. And they all said, to my wonderful daughter. Surely she wasn't as wonderful as those cards made her sound to me. And then suddenly it dawned on her. Yes, she prayed to God would lead her to the right card. Maybe God had, after all. Maybe the card was sitting right in front of her. So she put that one card back in the rack, and she picks up another one. And it was just a blank card with a beautiful bouquet on it. And she thought, and she brought it, went home, and she wrote in it, to my mother on Mother's Day, thank you for being you, with love, from your imperfect daughter. Jesus told his followers, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. I think those are perfect words for Mother's Day. In fact, I think those words are a model for all of us, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, siblings, friends, because God loves each and every one of us. And because of that, we should love one another. Because God forgives us, we should forgive one another. The self-giving love of God is central to the good news of Jesus Christ. One thing that we need to know from our readings this morning is that there is a relationship between love and happiness. Jesus said to his disciples, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be complete. You see, love is essential for joy. Love is central for happiness. E. Stanley Jones, in his book, Growing Spiritually, writes a fictional story. Tells about this man who has, lives in this fantasy world. All he has to do is think about something and poof, it appears in front of him. So the man just sits back and says, I want to live in a great big mansion. And poof, there's this 15 bedroom mansion, three stories, servants there to wait on his every need. And of course, a place like that, and some beautiful cars. So he thinks, well, I want a driveway full of expensive cars. Poof, there's Mercedes, there's BMWs, SUVs, you name it, he's got it there. And he can either drive himself or he's got this line of chauffeurs ready to drive him around. So he's out for a drive, comes home, and he's thinking, man, I'm hungry. I'd love a really beautiful, scrumptious, classic meal. Poof! The table's just full of every delicacy you can imagine. The scents are just overwhelming. Such a beautiful meal. But after a while, he starts to get bored. He's realizing he's unchallenged. So he tells one of the servants there, you know, I want to get out of this. I want to create some things of my own again. I'd rather be in hell than to be here. To which the servant replies, where do you think you are? So, what does it take to make us happy? I'm afraid I don't have an answer for that. There is no definitive formula. If you do this, you're going to be happy because it varies from one person to the next. But I can say this, no one can be truly happy who is not in a proper relationship with God and with the people around him. It's hard to be happy if you only live for yourself. Classic example, Ernest Hemingway. He desperately wanted to be happy, but he wanted to do it on his own terms. Deeds Lawrence once said of Hemingway that his morals could be characterized like this. Avoid, <coughs> avoid one thing only, getting connected up with anybody. Scott Donaldson, in his study of Hemingway, says that was really Hemingway's philosophy. Hemingway once fired a babysitter because his sons were getting attached to the babysitter too much. Hemingway said, 
You could only love a person so much, then you had to stop. Otherwise, you were going to get hurt. You had to set limits, or you're setting yourself up to be hurt. Imagine setting yourself, setting limits on loving somebody because you want to avoid the pain of being hurt. C.S. Lewis, great author there and theologian, once wrote on the subject of love when he said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies or little luxuries, avoiding all entanglements. Lock it up safely in the casket or coffin of your own selfishness. But in that coffin, in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. In his own way, Lewis was saying exactly what Jesus said to his disciples in that reading. Where there is no love, there can be no happiness. Happiness is a byproduct of love. But Jesus makes another point as well about love. Love requires sacrifice. He explains it like this. No one has a greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Now that is the ultimate sacrifice. But when we love somebody, there's pretty much not, there's not much we wouldn't do for that person. Now that's not to mean say that we go and we lay down our own life, sacrifice our own life for somebody. But when it comes to you loving somebody, it means you might give up a lot of your personal comforts to see that that person you love has a slightly better life. Just think of your own children. As a loving parent, there's not much you wouldn't do to protect them and see they have the best chance to succeed in life. When we become a parent, we give up a lot of our own lives to see that our children are provided for as the best we can. And we do this without a second thought. We do this because of the love we have for them. And when they turn out to be good adults, we know we did our job right and we're happy. Now that's not to say they're gonna challenge us and push our patience to the limits over the years, because they certainly will. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story of Princess Alice. Princess Alice was the second daughter of Queen Victoria. Now she had a four-year-old son that she loved very much. Sadly, that boy contracted a disease known as black diphtheria, a bacterial disease, highly infectious and very deadly. Alice, her own health being fragile at the best of times, was advised that she stay away from the boy because it could put her own life in danger. And naturally, this was difficult for any mother, but still she knew that the danger she was putting herself in if she ignored that warning. One day, Princess Alice was standing in the far corner of her son's room, and she heard the son whisper to the nurse, Why does mommy come and kiss me anymore? Well, that was more than she could bear. Tears streaming down her face, she ran to her son's bed, took him in her arms, and started smothering him with kisses and telling him how much she loved him. Tragically, Tragically, she too contracted that disease, and in a matter of weeks, both of them died of that disease. I think all of us who are parents understand why Princess Alice did what she did. When you love somebody, when you truly love somebody, no sacrifice is too great. Throughout history, the driving force that has moved humanity forward has built the willingness of parents to make any sacrifice to ensure that their children would have a better life. But sadly, this is not always the case. We see cases where parents put their own happiness ahead of that of their children. People stuck in addictions will still try and raise their children. Parents who are out partying while a baby sleeps in the next room. Deadbeat dads who would sooner party it up than work to provide for their children. We see marriages break up all too often. Here we're saying a classic case of people who are looking for happiness without first investing in the love that is required to bring that happiness about. If you look to put happiness first and foremost, you are surely setting yourself up to fail right from the start. I recall a case many years ago. I was working 
for CAA at the time, was called out for a roadside flat tire. Arrived on the scene to find a young woman, a small child there next to her, and she was expecting another child fairly soon. She had a flat tire, and after looking at the tires, was surprised with just one flat. The other tires were in rough shape. The call came in from her mother, who had the CAA membership. But as I was changing the tire, she told me her first call was to her boyfriend, who was the father of that child and the one she was expecting. But he was too busy playing a video game to come out and help her. So she had to call her mother to get the help. Obviously, having fun was more important than going out and helping the ones that he loved. It's no wonder so many families are in crisis today, because that story is so typical of today's world. How can we, as followers of Jesus Christ, ignore the models that the Gospels provide for us? Because God so loved the world that he gave his own Son so that we might live, and we might learn to love as Jesus loved. Where there is no giving, there is no love. That is true within the family, it is true between friends, it is true within society. A society in which everybody is looking out for number one is the society that's in trouble. We're seeing classic examples of this in the past year. Large protests in parks, city parks, of anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, mar marching in these parks. These people are only interested in me first, and the hell with my neighbor because the neighbor can look after themselves. We, <clears throat> we people are putting our own personal happiness in front of that of our neighbors. Remember, love is the very essence of our faith. In verse 17 of our text, Jesus says, These things I command you, that you love one another. And Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, wrote, Though I have all faith that I can remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. That pretty much sums it all up. If we cannot love, our faith is nothing but a sham. There's a story about Deborah Michael. Now, early one Sunday, one Saturday morning, she was on her way to work there at the downtown office. She saw a crowd of onlookers standing around a police officer that was laying on the ground. The officer had just been shot. He was loaded into an ambulance. She learned later that a homeless person actually shot that police officer. Later that day, the officer died. And she became very upset by what happened, and her anger grew into hatred. She could not look at a homeless person without blaming them for the officer's death. But as a Christian, Deborah recognized that she would have to do something to reconcile that anger and that hatred. And she found the best way was to volunteer at a local soup kitchen, a soup kitchen downtown, at a downtown church. She would go there early in the morning, Saturday morning, and spend hours getting the meals together. And they would serve those meals to the homeless people as they came through. And behind every person was a story, and she started to listen to those stories. She said, as I looked into the grateful eyes of those hungry people, my anger melted and I realized each one of those persons is a beloved child of God, just as I am. When she learned to love them unconditionally, as Jesus does, her anger evaporated, disappeared. Love is the very essence of our faith. If we are not able to love, then there's something very superficial about our faith. We began this morning with a story about a young woman searching for that perfect Mother's Day card. A card for a very imperfect mother. But in doing so, she reminded herself how imperfect she was. Sometimes the most difficult people to forgive are those that are closest to us. But then there was Jesus. He went to the cross. He died for some very imperfect people. People like you and me. How tragic if we cannot forgive and accept those who love us, even as Jesus has forgiven and accepted us. Love and happiness are intertwined. They are inseparable. But love requires sacrifice. But love leads to happiness. Therefore, we have to learn to sacrifice in order to be happy. Love does not come easy in an imperfect world. But love is a central commandment that Jesus gives all of us. That is the commandment he gives us all. 
It's not easy, but then again, it is never easy to do the right thing. But when we love as we are commanded, we find that that happiness makes it all worthwhile. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love, a love so strong that can reach even me. Help us to lead lives of faith. You will promise to shine on our path and to lighten our burdens when we forsake all other things and follow you. Help us to follow in confidence, in joy, and in peace, trusting in your mercy, your grace, and your care. O oh Lord, Hear our prayer. We pray today, O oh God, for those who live in darkness rather than the light. Show them through our lives and our witness that there is a new hope, and that the darkness around them can be overcome, and that they are forgiven when they believe in your Son. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Bless those, we pray, who go forth in your name to bring light to the world. Anoint those who work in missions. Strengthen all who work in your name to advance your kingdom here on earth. O Lord, hear our prayer. Look in favor, we pray, upon those who dwell in sadness and despair this day. Bless those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit, and fulfill their needs as we call upon you. Today, we especially hold in our prayers the family of Lesta uh, Glanville, who passed away this past week. And we also pray for those that we name now in the sons of our hearts, and those whose names are known to to you, O Lord. And finally, Father, help all those who feel weighed down by their efforts to care for the world, to lighten up in their practice of love and of justice and to testify to the new life in Christ with laughter as well as seriousness, with joy as well as somberness. We ask this in the name of the one who taught us that seven days without prayer makes one week. Amen. And now I invite you all to join in the prayer that Jesus taught us as we all say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, that peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of God's total and inclusive love. Shown to us when he sent his son Jesus to teach us what love is all about. And that same Jesus is still saving and redeeming broken hearts and lives to this very day. In the blessing of God, the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer, be with you all and remain with you always. Amen. Oh,